Buenos días con todos. Eh, bienvenidos a este inicio del Empecemos Entendiendo Webinars del mes de febrero. En esta ocasión vamos a iniciar con el tour en vivo por CUNE en Alemania, visitando las líneas de geomembranas, coextrusión, láminas y películas planas. Para esta ocasión nos va a acompañar Thorsten Bohm, es el director de ventas NAFTA de CUNE Group, y también Harald Schindler, que es gerente de ventas para Latinoamérica de CUNE Group. Uh, good morning, Thorsten. Thank you very much to you and your organization for joining us today and allowing us to live this great experience of visiting the CUNE facilities. I give you the control and let's go. Thank you very much uh, for the nice words. I hope uh, everyone will enjoy the tour. Um, we will show you three lines today within our facility. One extrusion line is uh, designed to manufacture ABA sheet inline straight into a thermoforming machine. Um, one specialty on that line is an unwinder we have to laminate a barrier film onto the sheet itself. The second line we're going to show is an 8.5 meter wide extrusion line for ABA geomembranes. And the third line we're going to show is a line for optical sheet made of ABS and PMMA. I will switch now to the front side camera so you can see the line in front of you. So that's the first line we have a look at. Um, this line is a high speed extrusion line. We have an unwinder here. We have a look at this later on a bit closer. And then on the front side, we have the feed block and the die tool in front of the road stack. And on top of the platform, we have two extruders providing uh, an ABA sheet. Now, if it comes to co-extrusion, um, like I said, in that particular case, we are talking about an inline concept. But uh, what is high-speed extrusion in detail? Um, that's something I would like to explain to you and what other alternatives do we have? Now, what you see here, that's about the same uh, concept you see on the shop floor. This is an inline concept. So behind the road stack, we have a loop control and goes straight into a thermo thermoforming machine. That's what you see in that area here. So there is no post-cooling section in between anymore. We try to keep the temperature as high as possible to speed up the, um, the thermoforming speed and to have a much better layer distribution on barrier sheet, for example, after the thermoforming process. Um, now that's an inline concept. Uh, we provide these high-speed extrusion lines for seven layer sheet also with offline equipment, as you can see on that picture here. So in that particular case, we don't go straight into a thermoformer. We go into a post-cooling section here. After that, we have one accumulator. And after the accumulator, we have any kind of winder. Could be an A-frame winder, could be a turret winder. Different concepts are available. We have also a very nice and uh, unique concepts for the same applications for um, multi-layer sheet with a um, roll stack underneath the platform, um, as you can see on that picture. So that reduces the space required to install such a machine inside of your facility. Now, if we talk about high-speed extruders, uh, that's something you see on the next picture. That's one of our high-speed extruders. In total, we have three sizes. Uh, you will see two on top of the platform here. We just have a walk onto the platform. Our high-speed extruders, they come with 60 millimeter diameter. Um, 70 millimeter diameter and 90 millimeter diameter. The setup is the same as you can see here in front of you. We usually have a direct drive, a torque motor, so there is no gearbox in between the motor and the barrel anymore. That reduces uh, the amount of maintenance required, so there's no maintenance required for the gearbox anymore. And it's also much more energy efficient because you don't lose any energy uh, with the gearbox in between. 
And we use motors that come with a high RPM, so they rotate very fast. And that enables us to work with these motors in their field consumption. And that makes the whole high-speed extrusion process very, very energy efficient. These extruders have usually 33 times the diameter in length, up to 39 times the diameter. We can cover a range of 240 kilogram per hour up to 2,200 kilograms per hour with these uh, three types of high-speed extruders. So here's a 70 millimeter extruder for the regrind layer. The other extruder is a 60 millimeter extruder, a conventional one for the outer layer. As you can see, this one has a gearbox in between the motor and the barrel. If we walk around the extruders, we can have a look at the front side a bit closer. Now on the front side, you see screen changers. In that particular case, our customer was asking for all automatic hydraulic driven two piston screen changers, uh, but we can cover a very wide uh, variety of different screen changer types, depending on your preferences and your budget. From here, we extrude into a melt pipe and go downwards into the melt pump section we're gonna have a look at right now. Nicole, do we have any questions from the audience? Nicole, right now we don't have any questions. When we have uh, someone, we uh, uh, share with you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, what you see here, these are the melt pumps uh, underneath the platform. We use melt pumps on all the extruders to provide a very precise process flow and a very low pressure variation. That's really important if you want to extrude a high amount of regrind materials with a, a very wide variety of bulk densities. What you see here, that's uh, our lamella feed block. That's also what you see on the PowerPoint slide. A lamella feed block has two inserts. Um, this insert here, that's called the manifold insert. Now, what is that insert doing? Um, it literally guides a, a melt into a specific layer position. So if you change that insert, you can switch from an ABA sheet to an AB sheet or to a BA sheet. Uh, so you just change the position of each raw material within the layer structure. Now, in that particular case, it's kind of easy because we have only three layers, but we use that feed block up to seven layers. And then it becomes a bit tricky. Uh, you can run regrind out of center to one side only, or you can split it up to two sides. Uh, that's kind of a standard, I would assume. And the second insert right here, this is called the lamella insert. And that makes that feed block kind of unique. And that's the insert you see on the PowerPoint slide. Um, that insert has one gap for each layer and we bring all the layers together at one spot. So all the layers come together right here on the front side and that enables us to run a very precise uh, process as we don't have to fight against counter pressures, different flow speeds uh, and all that stuff you struggle with. And the lamella insert has, uh, as you can see, very narrow blades all over the width, right here. And they are swivelable up and down. So you can move each blade upwards or downwards. And that enables you to create a profile for each layer individually, depending on the raw material behavior, depending on the viscosity, and stuff like this. So if you have a raw material with a very low viscosity, you would close the gap in the center. So you would close the gap here and open the sides in order to have 
the melt distributed all over the flow channel with so that you get a very precise uh, layer distribution once the melt comes out of the dye tool. If you have a, a raw material with very high viscosity, a very stiff raw material, you would uh, literally open the gap in the center of the feed block right here. That's where you would open the gap and you would close it on the sides. Uh, so you will add a bit more raw material in the middle and less on the sides. So you do it like the opposite. That's how the feed block looks from the inside. Uh, we can add also um, bolt feed blocks to the lamella feed block in order to add additional layers to the outside. So this could be a, a high gloss layer, a soft touch layer, um, any other raw material that has to be added to the outside that comes with another temperature profile, stuff like this. But as you can see, you bring all the layers together at one particular spot. And if we go back to the previous picture, you also see that this feed block is not adjustable from outside. Um, so what's the reason? First of all, we don't want to have any manipulation of the process without allowance from any operation uh, manager. As we know from the past that if you have uh, items or equipment adjustable from outside, people from the night shift come in, they rework the whole line. Your quality team uh, goes crazy because uh, you cannot you cannot run the, the recipe properly 24-7. Um, um, you will have problems all the time as people try to do it better than the person before. That's why our system is not adjustable from outside. And having it adjustable, only stopping the machine, taking that insert out, also enables us to use blades that are much more narrow than uh, competitor systems and if you want to have it adjustable from outside you would have to integrate bolts so you need to have wider lamellas and you cannot run a smooth profile with wide lamellas compared to our system now that's uh, the final result so we just cross cut uh, a sheet coming from a competitor line that's what you see on the left side and uh, you can see these typical bone shaped edges. So raw materials tend to locate to the sheet sides in any ways. So having uh, systems that are not properly adjustable uh, bring you into a position where you over consume raw materials, usually very expensive raw materials like EVOH and adhesive in that particular case, uh, tie layers, coloration layers. Now, if we use our feed block and a very proper profile, um, which takes our guys about I don't know, one or two hours to, to find. Uh, we create a layer distribution that's really precise, as you can see on the right side. That system uh, is also, such as our extruders, integratable um, as retrofit into any line brand you might own. Now, Nicole, if we, uh, uh, Chris, uh, Thorsten, uh, yes, uh, I, I have a, a question. When yes. we we we, oh, le puedes traducir, Nicole, para apoyarme. Okay. Eh, eh, cuando tenemos esa variación en espesor de la capa barrera, qué efectos pudiera tener sobre eh, esa propiedad. Thorsten? Yeah, you need to ask me in English. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there's a question about which effects are the, um, the layer distribution. Voy, voy a sacarte del canal de, de traductor, eh, Nicole, para que pueda escucharte Thorsten. Ah, vale, perfecto. A ver si él te escucha. Correcto. You got it, Thorsten? No, I no. didn't get any question in English. Okay, there's a there's a, there's a question. Which effect? Do you hear me? I again? cannot. I cannot hear Nicole. But you can hear me. Voy a sacar. Voy a sacarte la de la interpretación. Listo. A ver. Okay. Eh, 
Thurston, so when there is a variation in the width, what would be the effect of that? In the width of the sheet, yeah? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so in that particular case, uh, you might have to find a new profile. So what we recommend or what a lot of custom sheet uh, extrusion companies do is they manufacture themselves multiple of these inserts or multiple uh, of the lamellas you have seen before, but in a solid way. Um, I go back to the graphic. Um, you should see it right now. <clears throat> Now here you can see on, uh, on the graphic that we have multiple uh, blades all over the width. Yeah? So from here to here, there are multiple blades depending on the profile you're looking for. The channel width is 100 millimeters. The most narrow blade we have is two. So you can add 50 blades to, to the bottom side and 50 to the top side. Uh, most of our customers would use this system as a, a trial and error system, like a toolbox. Once they figured out what the right profile is, they manufacture one solid lamella. So they, they, make, they make this out of one part and then it's related to the product and to the recipe and to the sheet width and then it's a quick change system. So you just okay. stop the line, you take the inside out, put the other one in, that's it. Okay, Nicole, you can say that in Spanish. Okay, am I ready to do the interpretation? Estoy lista ya para interpretar? Uh, if, if Thorsten finish the answer? Yes, yes you, you're done with the, with the answer, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, Nicole, you are in the Spanish channel. Perfect, perfect. Okay, we can continue. Yes, please. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, what you see on the front side, that's uh, one of our die tools. Uh, this die tool has a fast gap option. So what you see here, that's a brass nut. Uh, if you turn that nut, the bottom lip uh, goes up and down and you can run different sheet thicknesses without uh, changing any lip on the die tool. Uh, this die tool will also get a linear robot, uh, so-called a Maku die tool, that's gonna be adjusted right here on top of the die. And that one adjusts the restrictor bar bolts and also the flex lip bolts. Nicole, you're good? Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, we at Kuna, we have one business unit named K-Tool dedicated for in-house manufacturing. So we manufacture our own dies up to eight meters in width. We also manufacture our own extruders, own barrels, screws, uh, and also customized equipment, and also our feed blocks. Uh, so that makes us very unique on this planet, as most of our competitors don't have these abilities anymore. They source everything out. Now, if we have a look at the lamination station, that's the next important item of this line here. Um, we're going to see a two-station unwinder. If it comes to lamination, we always need to know what customers' expectations are. Now, that customer was looking for something advanced. So we have an all-automatic two-station unwinder here that uh, unwinds a barrier film that's laminated to the sheet itself. We have a cross-cutting and splicing unit in here. So... There's nothing manual, it's all by push button function. 
comes with its own control. And then on top of this unit, we have a haul off. Now that haul off is connected to our control system. We have an accumulator, a small one, acting as a denser for tension control. And on the front side here, we take the film from the accumulator, transport it underneath this platform here. So you have good accessibility to the die, to the accumulator, to the feed block and everything. And then on the front side here, we have uh, some additional spreader roll and then the rubber roll you can see, that's a tension control roll. So having that tension control roll and a haul of unit in combination with that accumulator enables us to adjust or to set any, any uh, tension you want. So, so you just go to the HMI and let the machine know what tension you wanna have on the film and that tension is kept. Now, furthermore here, you see a preheating roll, roll. So if you would like to laminate very thick film or sheet to another sheet, you need to bring this uh, to temperature. Now that one here goes up to 140 degrees C to preheat the film. And from there, we just guide the film towards the roll stack above this roll here and then into the first nip. Now that's about the line setup uh, you just saw. That's an ABA line for PP sheets and we laminate a barrier film with PP, EVOH and tie layers into the first nip. We have also lamination stations as you can see for the backside of the roll stack. Now this one here has a swivel device, a swivel arm and that can be positioned independently around the radius of the center roll. Now, in that particular case, we come with the lamination film from the backside. We heat this film up and the rubber roll that pushes the lamination film to the sheet can be positioned anywhere around the center roll. And you can also set the, the pressure for the lamination process. Now that enables you to create peel and seal effects and stuff like this. So it's not hot melt lamination, it's lamination by heat and pressure. On uh, the next um, slide, you see a lamination station downstream the line. So that's for example, for PET processes. Uh, you would come with the PET sheet from the front side. That PET sheet goes into a small roll stack on top of the platform, we have an unwinder and in the center of the platform, we have a small extruder providing PE melt between the sheet and the film coming from the top into the roll stack. Now that's also something we offer as retrofit uh, for different processes. Now, if we are looking at uh, the downstream side here, that's where we're gonna add a thermoformer at customer side once the machine is installed. Uh, this line has two post cooling rolls and we have a what we call a loop control. Now the film comes out of the line like this, like a loop and then straight into the thermoformer and that loop is controlled. Uh, we have two lower limits and two upper limits and these limits, they tell us if we need to speed up the extrusion line or if we have to slow it down as the thermoformer is always uh, the master. If we don't go straight into a thermoformer, if we have offline equipment, uh, we use winders. Uh, we have also our own winders. Uh, we can provide what we call central contact winders. So they come from our blown film division. So we have also a division dedicated for blown film only for high speeds and very thin film. And that's an all automatic winder that enables you to center wind or to contact wind, depending on your sheet or your film and the raw material as well as the speed. 
on the right side, you see one of our A-frame winders. So that's the most common uh, form of winders we provide, also coming from Pune. And the next uh, PowerPoint slide shows us uh, one of our turret winders and also a tool for the roll handling. So these are also applications we can provide and we cover. So as you remember, we have a business unit dedicated for manufacturing processes. So we can cover everything from the feed section all the way downstream to the winders. As you can see my colleagues, they are still running trials on the geo membrane line. So we just go to the other side of the building and continue with a line for ABS PMMA sheet for optical goods. Now that's the roll stack for the geomembrane lines, by the way. There are just the rolls missing, but just to give you an idea of the uh, yeah, sizes we can reach. Uh, Nicole, by the way, any question for the previous uh, topic? But I cannot hear you. Okay, uh, yes. Uh... Eh, Nicole, te voy a cambiar nuevamente, sacar de la función de intérprete para que puedan escuchar. Okay. Eh, a second, Thorsten, uh, sorry. Sure. Ok. Um, in the, ok, en la línea de extrusión de PET ABA, él menciona que podemos utilizar PET y un film barrera. Okay, Solamente pudiéramos también utilizar o mezclarlo con polietileno o con algún otro tipo de material. Ok. Con mezclar, can you por, hear? Si acaso, por si acaso, eh, Nicole, con mezclar me refiero colocar uno sobre otro, ¿no? Porque son capas realmente de material. Oh, ok. O sea, como combinarlo yeah. con otro. Exactamente. I think, okay. I, think I, I think I understood that question. Uh, the, <laughs> film, the film we added to the sheet, that was a PE film. That was not a PET film. So it was different raw materials. Ok, eh, creo que entendí la pregunta. El material que utilizamos fue un... May, may you repeat what was the one you actually used? Uh, we had a PET sheet, ABA, and then we added a PE sheet uh, film with barrier layer in between. Ok. Yeah, so eh, it was PE added to PET. Ok, entonces lo que hicieron ellos fue agregar PE a un, P, un, un PE a un PET. Sí, no pero... el que habías mencionado. Y polietileno a PET. Ajá. Son dos tipos Correcto. de Correcto. Yeah, o sea, eso fue de hecho lo que hicieron. Ok. That, Pero también pudiesen uh, utilizar otro tipo de material distinto al, al, al PE, al polietileno. So, okay. for example, if they wanted to use a different material from PE, would that be possible? Yeah, but we always need a kind of a hot melt to have everything sticking together. Yeah. So if we okay. have the same raw material grades, we can just heat them up and push them together. If we have different raw material grades, we need some, something acting as a adhesive. Ok, entonces lo, lo importante en este caso es realmente tener un material que esté eh, en fusión caliente para que permita trabajar como adhesivo. Ya sea que sea el mismo material, uno esté calentado y cumple esa función, o cualquier otro material que funcione como adhesivo. Perfecto, entonces lo que le está diciendo es que no se necesita un adhesivo, sino el mismo calor haría el contacto es, entre los dos tipos de materiales. Exactamente. Ok, hay otra pregunta aquí en el chat, Nicole. ¿Qué diferencia hay entre laminar polietileno y polipropileno con el PET? O sea, la, la consulta sería que la persona quiere, quiere laminar PET con polietileno y PET con polipropileno. ¿Qué diferencia hay para laminar polietileno y polipropileno con PET? Okay, so um, the question is, what would be the difference to laminate um, a polyesterine with um, like polyethylene, PE? Polyethylene, polyethylene. Polyethylene and polypropylene. Que es PE and PET, correct? PEP. Es que no les escucho bien. Polypropylene y polyethylene, no, con polyethylene, con PET. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, Polystyrene and polypasterine with PET. What would be the difference to combine those? 
the, the, the difference between uh, adding PP to PET or PE to PET. Yeah? Uh, the difference yeah. is uh, the, the process temperatures, the optical, um, uh, how, the, how the final product looks like and stuff like this. So um, I would say people would do it depending on the availability of, um, of barrier film. Uh, so that could be one reason and also mechanical properties of the final product. I mean, yeah. Ok, entonces la diferencia sería eh, más que todo en la temperatura a usar y la finalidad que se tiene con el producto, o sea, el tipo de, de capa barrera que se va a utilizar y cuáles son las propiedades que necesitan que el producto final tenga. Perfecto. De todas maneras, le estoy consultando, a ver, ya, ya ir Angelista haciendo otra pregunta, ¿cuál es la temperatura máxima que emplean en la línea de extrusión? What is the highest temperature or the maximum temperature that you would use in an extrusion line? Uh, we go up to uh, 400 degrees C, for example. So there are some medical raw material grades yeah, that need very high temperature. Okay, the maximum so, would be 400 degrees centigrade. For example, there are some materials medical that need temperatures very high. Were you going to say something else? No, no it's, a, it's a last question right now. ¿Esa fue la última pregunta? Hasta ahora, sí. Eh, okay, okay. Eh, 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 la persona que preguntó la diferencia entre PET con polietileno y PET con polipropileno dice, eso es lo que quiero saber, ¿cuál es el uso de la mina? Además, bien, estás preguntando en qué puedo utilizar la okay. laminación PET polietileno y PET polipropileno. ¿Qué uso okay. conoce al menos Torsten en este aspecto? Ok, so the actual question, I'm sorry, about combining PE and PP is... Um, what would be the use of this product? If you do um, a sheet with PE and PP, um, what would be the, um, the, the use for it? Just one moment. Okay, so what would be the use of combining PET with PE or PET with PP? Like what is the difference in the, the final product for usage? Yeah. Um, it's, so we just add this uh, lamination film with barrier properties to increase the product life cycle time. Yeah, so it just lasts for a longer time. It's usually used for food packaging applications. Okay, uh, which is the combination that would make it last longer? Um, I think it's, it's about the same. Yeah, that's coming from the EVOH uh, thickness. Yeah, the, the main material PE or PP has just other mechanical properties other haptic, so it feels different, it looks different. Ok. Entonces, es, realmente se utiliza con una capa barrera eh, para darle más durabilidad al producto final. Esto generalmente se utiliza en productos de alimentos. Ahora, me dice, la, las, eh, serían bastante similares, depende más de como la textura final o el producto final que estés buscando, pero esa es eh, generalmente la, la finalidad, darle más eh, durabilidad al producto. Perfecto. Ok. Sí. Yes. Ok. Te cambio okay. el canal de Nicole. ¿Perdón? Te cambio okay. el canal de intérprete. Uh -huh. Please, Torsten. Ok. So, uh, now we have a look at a line as on the next slide. Um, now, this line is designed or is made for a customer in Europe. Uh, we run five layer sheet, uh, three layers ABA, two layers PMMA on top of it. Uh, going through a multi-channel die um, and we're gonna have a look at all these items right now. I just switched to the front side camera. Now as you can see here in orange, um, that was a color on customer demand. Uh, we can, by the way, paint any color um, customers want uh, for corporate uh, designs. Um, now here we have five conventional extruders. Uh, all of them has a double degassing uh, on the other side, but we're going to start on the back side just to show you different opportunities or different options for the motor side. Now, uh, that's the main extruder, for example, for the regrind layer, ABS regrind. Um, that one has a motor gearbox connection using a V-belt. We can also connect motor straight to the gearbox on demand, um, but the customer decided to have a V-belt in between, which is uh, pretty common still. Um, this motor has also a uh, oil temperature control here or oil cooler. Uh, we also provide as an option a metal uh, detector to find metal particles inside of the oil that would uh, guide to 
any kind of awareness uh, of any of the gears within the gearbox. Here we have a, a temperature control unit. We use uh, Belimo valves to control the feed section so they regulate the water flow. Um, we can also temperature control uh, the feed section using uh, oil temperature control units uh, or, or water temperature control units, uh, for example, to have them, yeah, depending on the raw material, a very smooth guidance into the barrel. And on the other side, if we have a look at uh, one of the co-extruders, you see that the co-extruders, for example, in that particular case, they come with another motor option. So before we just saw a standard extruder uh, with a motor and a gearbox, and here we have a planetary gear motor. So that box has a center wheel, a center gear wheel, and four motors around. That's a planetary gear motor. So you can see all the extruders are mounted on carts for uh, thermal expansion to the backside. That's something you need to consider if you have multiple extruders, what's the zero point uh, for all the equipment to expand once it's heated up. And here we have a double venting. We go up to uh, four venting openings uh, on demand, depending on the raw material grade. But uh, for ABS, a double venting is sufficient enough to get rid of pre-drying. <clears throat> so we don't use pre-drying if we have a double venting, uh, depending on the final application. All of the extruders here have all automatic uh, two piston screen changers again on customer demand. But again, we have also more simple screen changers available. Uh, these ones here are from uh, Nordson, for example. That's something we don't manufacture ourselves, um, but we can also provide simple screen changers with a ratchet or a hand lever, or even more advanced screen changers uh, that are rotating from Gnois, for example. And here at the front side, we bring all the layers together. So there are all the melt pipes going into the feed block and the die. Now, if we walk around <coughs> the extruders and have a look at the front side, um, there are again, a lot of options available. Now, what you see here, that's a very advanced and customized uh, die card. Now that die card here is gonna be placed on rails on the floor in order to shuttle the cart in and out of the line center for cleaning purposes, for changing purposes. That's a four channel die. Um, if it comes to ABS PMMA, we always need to consider that we have different temperatures. Uh, so PMMA and ABS can, yeah, are better extruded through multi-channel dies. We can also provide uh, mono channel dies, but uh, the results will not be comparable to the results using a multi-channel die, as you can see here. On the back side, there's a feed block. Um, so again, that's a big topic. We can go from, uh, from a, a lamella feed block and a mono channel die all the way up to a four channel die having each layer controlled individually and there's a huge price gap in between. Uh, so that's something we need to talk about if it comes to ABS PMMA. What you see on the line, uh, we have fast changing plugs all over the place. Also here, that's something we also need to consider if we talk about thick sheet lines as the startup process takes quite a long time. So that's why people don't want to interrupt the process once it started. And that's why we have on demand, that's also an option, um, fast changing plugs all over the place so that um, operators during the night shift can change a, a heater band, for example. Uh, most of our customers don't want to have electricians running around during the night shift, and that's why everything is changeable. Uh, by the way, uh, so this die was on customer demand also from Nordson, but we can also provide uh, our own dies as well, also multi-channel dies. Now, next important item downstream the line is the roll stack. <clears throat> which you see here. Um, on the road stack for six sheet lines, um, we usually offer our customers what we call a fast changing system for the center roll. 
you can also get this for the bottom roll to get better accessibility to the roll for roll changes if you run different surfaces, different embossings. Um, now that system has a disconnection here between the motor and the roll itself. So you just untighten a couple of bolts and then you are able to remove the motor by turning this hand wheel here. Now the motor and the gearbox, they're connected to a guiding rail system and turning that hand wheel here moves the motor away from the roll in that direction. Now, once this is done, you can manually or all automatic shuttle the roll out of the roll stack. Now the roll is connected again to a guiding rail system. And if we wanna get access to the roll, we wanna have it in a position shown on the next PowerPoint slide. Now that's how the roll stack is shuttled out of the center line of the roll stack. That's another option we provide for our customers extruding sheets, thick sheets with a different surface, surfaces or different embossings. Our roll stacks are height adjustable, um, motor driven. Uh, by the way, our roll stacks are all electric. So we have um, spindle drives for the, the nip closing and opening. That makes the roll stack again, very energy efficient as a spindle drive is fixed in its end position. Once you found a proper setup, there's no energy consumed anymore. Uh, but of course we can provide hydraulic roll stacks on demand with very basic hydraulics or advanced hydraulics using a servo hydraulic with uh, cylinders that have an integrated measurement system to control the nip or the whole hydraulic unit by weight or by pressure. So that could affect some of the processes for thinner sheet dramatically to have that opportunity. And the height adjustment is also spindle drive uh, driven. We have uh, two spindles on the front side and on demand or as an option, two spindles on the back side to lift the roll stack up uh, linear. We can uh, add uh, um, spindle drives that even cover a whole roll diameter. Now you need to imagine if you run different embossings on the sheet, different surface structures. Sometimes your end customer says, I wanna have that surface on the top side or on the bottom side. So I have seen multiple extrusion companies with people flipping sheet over at the end of the process. They turn the sheet up and down. Now having spindle drives that lift the roll stack up and down by a whole roll diameter enables you to use the roll stack for an up stack pr process. You, so you go into this nip here, or you go down stack. You would just lower the roll stack and you go into the top nip and then through the center roll and then uh, through the downstream line as the center line of the extrusion would stay in its place. So you just lift the roll stack up and down and also the post cooling section is able to be moved up and down. So there's no need for sheet turning anymore. Nicole, any questions so far? Uh, uh, Torsten, we don't have any question right now. Okay, perfect. Uh, maybe we take the other side. <clears throat> okay, um, we can uh, of course... Torsten, Torsten yeah. sorry, we have, we have a question. Nicole, I changed your uh, channel. Okay. Okay. Ok, eh, pregunta, ¿los dos rodillos tienen las superficies iguales o deberían ser distintos, diferentes? The three rolls have the same um, surface or they should be different? Um, that, that depends on the final product. So that's product related and raw material related. So they can have different surfaces depending on the raw material. So there are some raw materials that are a bit more sticky. Uh, in that particular case, you need sandblasted surfaces, but there are other optical goods that require clearness. In that case, you have a high polished surface. So it really depends on the final application on the raw material. Okay. They can also um, have different diameters, yeah? 
Ok. Entonces, eh, va a depender realmente de eh, la materia prima y del producto final deseado. Por ejemplo, hay materia prima que es un poco más pegajosa. En ese caso, se necesitaría una superficie que, tenga, eh, que sea más arenosa. Ahora, si es un producto que no tiene estas características, entonces puedo usar un rollo que esté completamente pulido. También eh, se pueden usar diferentes eh, diámetros de rollo o longitud. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have also, as you can see on the next slide, uh, horizontal roll stacks. Uh, now that's for high advanced optical goods for polycarbonate or PET sheets uh, or even PMMA sheet. In that particular case, we extrude into the first nip from the top side. And that gives us better controllability of the melt before touching any surface. The film is extruded around the center roll and then around the top roll like this. Now the top roll in that particular case here uh, is coming with an angle. Yeah, um, We can also provide an option that this roll is swivelable. So depending on the cooling behavior you would like to achieve on the center roll, you can swivel this roll up and down. Now if you swivel it upwards, if it's in this position, you have more cooling capacity on the center roll. Yeah? And if you move it into this position here, you have less cooling capacity on the center roll. So that could be important if you would like to have a line that's really universal for different raw material grades that have different behaviors in terms of crystallization. Now, in the meantime, I went uh, upstairs uh, to the post-cooling section. Now, this post-cooling section is coming with two platforms on the left and on the right side. Um, in that particular case, we have idler rolls only. So what you see here, these are idler rolls, but we can also add cooling rolls to the post-cooling section. This could start at four post-cooling rolls or maybe 10, and we can also add a, a, a very high number of post-cooling rolls depending on the thickness of the sheet, depending on the quality you would like to reach, depending on the line speed. And we have also a post-cooling section as uh, shown on the screen. Now the first uh, picture on the right side, uh, that's a what we call a calibration unit. It's a top cooling section here. And that's adjustable up and down to create more or less pressure. And that's also adjustable in extrusion direction to find the most sweetest spot according to your process and the raw material. And as you can see on that picture, now that customer was looking for something very advanced. So we have one motor for each role. Each role is controlled individually. We can also provide the same unit using one motor for a group of roles. We can do the same with the temperature control. We can control individually or a group of roles. Now that unit helps everyone run in thick sheet to start up the process uh, as the sheet is kept in a flat way. On the right side, you see that this unit is also coming with a platform and even a own control panel to control the roles individually or the group of roles from the platform uh, for have a better uh, ability of visual inspection once you change anything. Now the next important item uh, we need to talk about or we need to consider if we talk about thick sheet is a web cutter or an edge cutter. Now in that particular case, you can see that uh, we have spindles to position all the, uh, the cutters along the line width. Um, that could be also motorized. And you can also see that the dive in and out is um, done manually using hand wheels. We have even more, at, more basic systems. That's something um, that's an intermediate system anywhere between basic and advanced. But the next picture show you that just the sky is uh, the limit. Um, so you're gonna see, one second. You're gonna see a motorized system on this screen or on that slide. Um, so the dive in and out is motor driven as you can see. There are motors for each knife to dive in and out. And there are also motors on the side to position each knife. 
We can provide heated knives or non-heated knives, and we can also provide very narrow infrared bars. Now these infrared bars would be positioned um, right here, just to heat up a very narrow surface before the knife cuts. Now that enables you also to use a knife for a much longer time before it's worn. Here you're gonna see these infrared bars, very narrow ones on the left side. And on the right side, you see rotary cutters uh, for harder materials, uh, for yeah, raw materials that would just kill standard knives. And here you see another system we provide. Um, that system keeps three knives in place. You need to imagine that one knife is positioned here, another knife is positioned here, another knife is positioned here, and there's always one knife in the cutting position. Now, if this knife here, if this is one, you just push a button, the unit goes up, the plate rotates into the next knife position and dives back in, and the second knife is cutting. Now that's the most advanced system uh, we can provide in combination with all the previous mentioned options. Okay, if we go downstream the line, we have uh, again a thickness gauge and now most of our lines, especially very wide lines, they use uh, thickness gauges, different kinds of thickness gauges, capacitive systems, X-ray systems, beta gauges. Um, yeah, whatever you can imagine, we can integrate it all. And um, here we have a protection film unwinder, a very basic one for protection film, uh, using electromagnetic brakes to control the tension. We have a unit on the bottom side uh, to press or to yeah to press the uh, protection film against the sheet, and then we have a cutting unit. And in the next position, you you see two winders to to wind the cut off between the different webs. Now that line is designed for different webs, and if you extrude and you cut and the webs are separated, you have a very very narrow stripe between the, the webs of um, protection film, and that's cut off and wind it here again. Now, what we also can add to the downstream side, to the post cooling section, these are embossing stations or also lamination units for the sheet that could be integrated into the post cooling section here on the top side. And the back side, as you can see, is not finished yet. So we have two hall of units. That's something you need to consider. We always recommend two hall of units on thick sheet extrusion, as we keep the sheet straight in, uh, in the, according to the line center in extrusion direction. And if one rubber roll is worn, one of the hall of units, you don't have to stop the line. You just uh, stop one hole of unit, you open it, you stop it, and you are able to rework the rubber roll to grind it without stopping the line. That's also important on very thick sheet. Now here, there's still a gap. You see one guillotine for the edge cut, but on the backside, there's gonna be, uh, as you were able to see on uh, the layout, there's gonna be a... Um, a palletizer, so we have a cross cut guillotine and saw that's a combi device. And then we have one palletizer here. Um, now, the cross cut uh, saw guillotine combi device is used if you have a very wide uh, variety in or variation in thickness. So up to a couple of millimeters, you would use the guillotine to get rid of dust and uh, also noise, of course, and to get a cleaner cut. And then from there on, if the guillotine uh, cannot manage the thickness anymore, you would use a saw for the cr crosscut process. Um, and we can also integrate a milling device to finish the edge cut. Now, if you want to have a very smooth and very straight edge, we can just use a milling device also for different kind of radiuses. Uh, that's another option we offer. 
If it comes to palletizing, we have customers using skizzers tables, like just uh, tables for manual palletizing. But we can also, of course, integrate um, like two or three position palletizers, all automatic robots that do the job um, for your employees. Nicole, I think we are ready with this line. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Uh, at the moment, we don't have any question. Okay. Oh. Okay, so we can continue with the geomembranes, yeah? Okay, now that's uh, Champions League in extrusion, what you saw before, um, the line over there, that was 1.3 meters. This line here is 1.8 meters in uh, diameter or in width, uh, sorry, not in diameter, in width. We go up to 3.5 meters uh, for thick sheet. We go up to 1.5 meters for inline extrusion for packaging applications or even wider if you run offline and cut different webs. And we go up to 8.5 meters if it comes to membranes. Um, if it comes to membranes, we uh, have to subdivide the industry. So there are roofing membranes made of PVC or TPUs or some other raw materials, but very wide uh, membrane lines are used for geo membranes and they are typically made of uh, HDPE and LDPE. And I'm going to show you the layout just in a few seconds. Just need to load it. And then we just go uh, through a couple of slides, giving you some background information on geomembranes, what they're used for, and stuff like this. Now, on this layout, you see the geomembrane line in front of us once it's finished. So that's a platform with the extrusion and the die. And right there is the roll stack, not finished yet, waiting for the big marriage. Um, so that's the, the front side of this layout. This is this one here. The post cooling section here, that's not even assembled in our place. Um, it's just not required such as the winder and the accumulator. So we are just testing the throughput and then the line is ready to go to be assembled at the customer's facility. Now, um, our geomembrane lines with single screw extruders, uh, they go up to 3.5 tons in throughput. On demand, I would say standard is 2.5 tons. We have a platform that's movable. We will also have a look at the bottom side of this platform later on. You have a walkway between the platform and the die. And on top of this platform, we have two extruders. Me traje trabajo acá para mientras como. A ver, puedo pasar, señor? Déjame pasar. Sorry again. Was that a question for me? Yeah, start. And we don't have any question right now. Okay. So we have two big extruders on this platform, depending on the throughput, uh, we go up to 250 millimeters in diameter. Uh, standard setup would be 200 or 230 for the main extruder and then 150 or 180 or maybe 125 for the co-extruder, depending on the throughput you would like to reach. Now, what are geomembranes used for? Uh, for waste disposal, for environmental protection, for example, for hydraulic engineering or civil engineering. Now here you see some uh, examples. Now this is Palm Island. I think it's called Palm Island in Dubai. So if you wanna create artificial landscaping, you need geomembranes. For uh, embankment seals, for example, that's where we use uh, geomembranes. For environmental protections, for dumps or for mining, something like this. For hydraulic engineering, for firefighting pools, for pond systems, as on the next picture, for water reservoirs or storage, that's important uh, in many, many regions of this planet and becomes 
more and more important. So this year we got a high order income from Northern African states, for example, for sealing of water channels, for fish farms in several regions, for, yeah, um, for air aircraft de-icing, foundation ceilings, for tunneling, and we use different raw materials, uh, so they are kind of standardized. Uh, there are very, there are different norms um, that will more or less tell you what raw materials to be used. So that could be HDPE or VLDPE, uh, but HDPE and LLDPE are LLDPE are the most uh, often used raw materials. So the raw materials used for geomembranes are high chemical resistant, uh, free from plasticizers, halogen free. They have a lower density compared to PVC that's used for roofing membranes. Uh, the UV resistant is very high. It's resistant to microorganisms, to roots, to rodents. They have high flexibility and physiologically, they're physiologically harmless. Um, there are two processes for the manufacturing of geomembranes. Um, so most of the people on that planet, they still, or yeah, I would, I would subdivide the industry 50-50. So some are using flat film lines as we manufacture, and some others have blown film lines. Um, now the difference comes into the game if we talk about um, precision and throughput. Now you need to uh, understand that the, the line you see on the picture has 3.5 metrical tons per hour in throughput. That's one line only. If you manufacture um, geomembranes using blown film lines, you need a high number of blown film lines, like three, four, five lines, depending on the size to reach this throughput. Now, that means also you have higher costs for operators, um, as you know, one guy cannot run several lines alone. And you have also a higher consumption in energy. And blown film lines are not really precise compared to flat film lines. Um, now what you see on the next picture, that's a die, one of our dies with a linear robot as mentioned before. And that robot adjusts the flex slip and also the restrictor bar. Now this robot is connected to the thickness gauge and having that control loop measuring the thickness and then giving that robot a signal what to adjust brings us to a thickness tolerance or variation of plus minus 1.25% or sometimes even below 1%. So let's say 2% in total. On most of the blown film lines, you have 5% plus minus, so 10% in total. So we talk about some percent difference, like six to 8% less raw material consumption because you can extrude and you can produce geomembranes much more precise compared to blown film lines. And if you multiply 6% with your total production hours and the raw material costs for that tonnage, that's a lot of money all over the year. So, um, to consider a flat film line for geomembranes really pays off, even if the initial investment is maybe a bit higher. Uh, here we say 17% oh, potential material saving. Well, let's compare the best with the worst. Um, some information you need to know about the linear robot for the die adjustment. You, we can also integrate a, a thermo bolt control. Um, so that does pretty much the same job but the tolerances are not as good as with the robot. And you also need to consider that any thermo bolt control um, is consuming energy. Every thermo bolt is a, is a heating element. So while it's adjusting the die lip, uh, it's heating up or it's cooling down, but in any way it consumes energy. The robot is only consuming energy if you turn any bolt, if anything is adjusted and it reacts much quicker. Now that's important for some of you that maybe run a custom sheet or a small, um, uh, small numbers of products. Also very interesting. Okay, Thorsten, sorry. Yeah. We have one, one question is about this slide. Um, uh, they, uh, let me change Nicole to the channel. The previous slide? Yeah. 
One minute, please, eh, Thorsten. Ok. Eh, una de las preguntas está directamente relacionada con, la, con el slide que, que Thorsten mostró, Nicole. Y es okay. que si la línea de geomembranas tiene la posibilidad de texturizar la superficie de la geomembrana. Justo creo que le voy a explicar, pero le puedes hacer la pregunta aprovechando que está allí. Ok. So one of the questions is actually about the slide that was just presented. And it's like, um, if the um, geomembrane line can actually give texture to the product. Ok. This one here. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is what we do using uh, different technologies. So we can use um, a device that uses different gases to um, have an impact on the surface. But most of the people today, as the quality requirements become um, yeah, more and more difficult to reach, they have uh, what we call spike rolls, and they create the design on the, uh, on the right side here. Now, this is what we call a spike membrane, and the rolls on the roll stack, they would have hundreds of thousands of tiny holes in a very precise Uh, way next to each other to create uh, a very nice uh, spike on the surface of the membrane and also a spike that's good to uh, deform. You need to have a closer look at the design of the holes themselves to understand that it's not uh, so easy to manufacture these roads. Um, we can add spikes to the membrane to both sides on demand. Okay. Eh, sí, esto eh, usa, um, eh, presenta uso de diversas tecnologías. Eh, existe un aparato que funciona con, con gas también eh, debido a la gran demanda de, de calidad de, de muchas personas. Se ha desarrollado este rollo que tiene spikes, como se ve en la foto. Eh, se le llama la membrana spike y tiene cientos de miles de, de huequitos o de, o de la superficie salida. Y al verlo de cerca se puede notar que no es algo que sea muy sencillo de, de producir. Ok. Eh, yeah. Otra pregunta es, ¿cuáles son los problemas que uno pudiera encontrar con este tipo de producto, o sea, las membranas, durante su producción? Ok, como que sean los datos más importantes que considerar o que influyen en su funcionamiento. Ok. The next question is, is, which are the main problems that you could face when using the geomembrane line? Like, which would be the most important things to take into consideration? To take into consideration? Uh, on, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you need to have a very good winder on the backside. So the wind or the winders we add to the lines, they always have a like we call it a safety run so if anything goes wrong with the automatic um like core magazine or anything like this we just uh, we just run a safety program to not stop uh, the line i mean that's the most important thing never stop a, a very wide line like this this needs to to run 24 7. okay eh, bueno debe contar con un, con un proceso de, de bobinado <coughs> que, que de bobinado que sea bueno y um, algo que tiene este sistema es que tiene que funcionar 24-7. Es un sistema que no se puede parar. Así que hay muchas opciones um, que, que buscan eh, mantener esa seguridad, de estabilidad de funcionamiento. O sea, que si hay algún problema, pues se pueda resolver sin necesidad de cambiar, de, de tener el, el equipo. Perfecto. Eh, una última pregunta de esta parte, eh, bueno, la pregunta inglés está en inglés, pero te la, te, la, te la digo para las personas que están escuchando en español. Eh, Thorsten dijo que la capacidad era de 3.500 kilogramos hora, ¿ok? Esta, este asistente consulta que para qué tipo de material es esa capacidad que él mencionó y qué pasa si usáramos materiales de mayor densidad. Ok. So, voy a proceder a leer la, la pregunta. Sí, es la última, de hecho. Yes. So, in, we have here it, that you said that 3,500 um, kg per hour is the capacity for that type of material. So, how much it goes down if we use higher density materials? No, that, that's, for, that's for high density and LLDPE. If we use materials with higher density, 
the throughput usually goes down. What uh, people also need to understand is um, sometimes it's not related to the raw material. Uh, like we can run 3.5 tons if the membrane has a flat surface. If we have spikes, uh, in that case, the problem is not coming with the raw material. The problem is coming with the forming process. So you need to, you need to form the raw material into the spikes. And for that, you need to slow down the line to a half of the speed or maybe a third. So in that particular case, we don't talk about different raw materials and their impact. It's about uh, the design of the spike that has an impact on the overall speed. Ok. Bueno, lo que decía es que eh, se pueden hacer de hasta 3.5 toneladas con un, eh, con un rollo de superficie eh, plana o cuando se requiere un producto de superficie plana. Ahora, si estamos usando un rollo de los que tienen los spikes, pues esta tendrá que bajar ya sea a la mitad o por lo menos un tercio. Por lo tanto, podemos concluir que no se trata de la materia prima que estemos utilizando como tal, sino del de producto que estamos creando. Y si hay spikes, pues claramente tendremos que bajar la velocidad porque es un proceso que va a tomar un poco más de tiempo. Perfecto. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Thorsten. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so on the next slide, you also see that the roads have yes. not... I'm, I'm sorry, Thurston. Just one moment so I can be interpreter again. Oh. Yeah, okay. So on the next slide, you see that uh, the roads have um, like spike holes, um, like all over the width, but the last millimeters, there are plain in order to have a surface, a very smooth and plain surface for the welding processes. Once these membranes are installed anywhere, they need to be welded together. And therefore we need to have a clean and smooth uh, surface. And on the next picture, um, you're gonna see that we even add a protection film to these surfaces. So uh, to both uh, sides to keep them clean. And this one is ripped off once the membranes are installed. Okay, also uh, very important if we have, or if we talk about membrane lines is, um, yeah, some, some mechanical um, designs that make uh, your life easier again. Um, here, for example, we subdivided uh, or we separated the motors and the gearboxes uh, from the roads. You need to imagine everything on geomembrane lines is heavy weight. So if you want to change anything, Uh, if you want to change a roll, you don't want to lift down the motor and the gearboxes. It's too heavy. So instead of doing this, we have crankshafts that's going to be added to the motor that connect the motors and the gearboxes with the rolls. Um, all the bearing housings are subdivided, for example, as you can see right here, to get better access to the bearings for changing purposes. And um, yeah, stuff like this. Uh, we also don't move the road stack anywhere. Uh, on a geomembrane line, usually the roll stack is fixed, as you can see on the plates on the floor, uh, because every roll that's going to be added to the roll stack weighs 20 metric tons. So this roll stack easily weighs 80 metric tons with all the rolls integrated. And comparing this to the platform, the platform is lighter. So we put the whole platform here on rails. Now these rails uh, shuttle the platform back and forth. And the road stack is only height adjustable to get as nice as possible to the first nip. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's pretty much it from my side for today. If we have any further questions from the audience, uh, please let me know. Um, If we talk about the backside of a geomembrane line, we have again numbers of options for the winders. We have surface winders, we have A-frame winders, we have a lot of automatization for the shaft handling or the core handling if you want to use cores. Um, yeah, just let us know. We do a lot of, or we, we almost only do customized equipment. So we can react to whatever demand you have or what any idea, whatever idea you have in your mind. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Thorsten. Uh, is possibly uh, doing some question to finish? Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, perfect.
Let me change uh, the channel of Nicole. Okay. Okay. Um, a ver, algunas pues, eh, preguntas. Um, ¿Las máquinas que presentaste son estándares o también pudiéramos eh, especializarlas dependiendo del proyecto que el cliente esté buscando? So the machines that you presented are standard or they could be specialized depending on the project of the client? Yeah, like, uh, like I said, we do a lot of customized stuff. So uh, the process, for example, the, the process of this machine, ABA sheet inline or seven layer sheet inline, that's standard. Uh, what's, what's customized? I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, Thorsten, your, your microphone is off. It, it, yes. Yes. Yeah. So okay. So this so this machine or the process is kind of standard. But the lamination unit underneath the platform, for example, that was customized. So usually the extruders are on the floor. There's no lamination on an inliner. That was customized. Um, most of the things we do on geomembrane lines are customized on the downstream side. So we know the process, but uh, how the line looks like, that's always customized. Also on sheet, we provide a lot of lines for thick sheet, also to competitors, yeah? And these competitors, they do from an outside perspective, pretty much the same product, but they want to do it a different and unique way. And we make that happen. Ok. Entonces, sí, como decía anteriormente, casi todos nuestros equipos son personalizados. Eh, tenemos procesos de ABA o procesos de, C, de siete eh, láminas. Entonces, como por ejemplo, el que él mostraba anteriormente en el video es eh, una máquina estándar, pero se puede ver que en la parte de abajo eh, hay una unidad de laminado que esta sí es personalizada, o sea, no suele venir con este equipo. Ahora, los procesos de las líneas de geomembrana tienden a ser bastante personalizados. Por ejemplo, hace no mucho hicimos eh, un equipo para eh, láminas de seis eh, capas para dos empresas que son competidoras, y de hecho estaban creando prácticamente el mismo producto, pero cada uno quería manejarlo de manera diferente, ese proceso. Por lo tanto, tenemos el conocimiento sobre cómo debe funcionar el equipo, o qué es lo que debe hacer el equipo, pero cómo quieren que lo haga dependerá eh, de, de las solicitudes de ustedes. Perfecto. Eh, penúltima pregunta. El, en el Centro de Tecnología de CUNE, ¿es posible hacer pruebas de diferentes materiales o incluso hacer pruebas en la lamela FitBlock? Ok, so in the Technology Center in CUNE, ¿es posible to trial different materials o to even try the, the lamela uh, FitBlock? Yeah, so uh, in our lab, we have always two lines. One is uh, dedicated for barrier sheets. So that has, uh, that can provide seven layers uh, for PP or PE, any packaging uh, grade. Uh, we have also one line for PET and also for uh, PCR treatment. Uh, and the PP line comes with a lamella feed block. The other line has a bolt feed block. So we can try different Uh, raw materials and different feed blocks and everything uh, we show today is also available as retrofit so we can also integrate our feed blocks our dies our extruders or whatever into existing lines okay. so see sí, in nuestro laboratorio siempre tenemos dos líneas por ejemplo tenemos una de siete capas de pp pe incluso de pt o pcr um, eh, tratamientos de PCR, eh, por ejemplo, eh, tenemos el PP que lo se puede hacer con la mela o con, eh, con tornillo y eh, tenemos eh, la posibilidad de probar diferente materia prima. Además, también ofrecemos el servicio de retrofit que consiste en que podemos aplicar tecnología nueva o tecnología nuestra a máquinas que ustedes ya tengan. Entonces se le pueden agregar estos cambios de todas las cosas que hemos visto el día de hoy. Perfecto. Eh, la última pregunta, eh, ¿cómo, cómo, ¿cómo ocurre o cómo es el control de la línea eh, para, los, eh, para las instructoras CUNE? ¿CUNE tiene un propio software o qué otro eh, aditamento para controlarla? 
Okay, so the last question is, um, how would be the control of the, uh, the QNL lines? Like, mm -hmm. do they come with their own software? Like, how is this process? Yeah, as I already understood the question in Spanish, I went to the control panel. So that's uh, our HMI panel. Uh, we use Siemens as hardware. So it's a Siemens S7-1200. Uh, we program everything with a TR portal and we work together with an industrial designer just a couple of years ago to redesign everything, to make it more self-explainable uh, uh, for the operators as we know that it's uh, very difficult to get good skilled people. That's not just a German phenomenon, that's a, a global problem. So that's why we made the machine easier to operate and we still have hardware to, uh, to uh, speed up the line, for example, for each rolls individually, for each extruder, for the overall line speed, just that people can easier operate the whole line with their gloves on, yeah? Okay. Eh, sí, bueno, como ya había entendido la pregunta en español, me dirigí hasta la pantalla para poder mostrárselos. Eh, tenemos un software de Siemens de 7.1200. Trabajamos, de hecho, con un diseñador industrial hace unos años, eh, porque entendemos que no es un asunto solo de Alemania, sino que es una situación global y queremos que el sistema sea más fácil para el, o, el operador. Entonces, por ejemplo, acá podemos ver que en nuestro sistema eh, tenemos las opciones digitales, además de que tenemos que cada extrusora se puede manejar individualmente con los botones que he señalado y eh, cada rol también, cada rollo se puede manejar también individualmente desde esta máquina. Uh, Nicole, maybe also important at that um, part of the conversation is the fact that we program everything ourselves. So we have our own software and we have people that are able to program customized functions too. Ok. Eh, también sería muy importante mencionar que nosotros programamos todo nosotros mismos. Por lo tanto, también tenemos la opción de programar eh, de una manera a personalizada el aparato según las necesidades que tengan, se le puede hacer a cada cliente. And the control is also available as retrofit for any line brand. Y también aplica lo del retrofit, así que este tipo de control también se le puede aplicar este, estos ajustes a cualquier línea que ya ustedes tengan. Perfecto. Excelente, Torsten. Thank you very much with, uh, for your webinar, for the, all the uh, capacities of CUNE in, in, in these different lines. ¿no? Eh, muchas gracias a, a Torsten, muchas gracias al equipo de CUNE por permitirnos haber visitado la planta en Alemania y permitirnos también ver pues, las diferentes capacidades de sus diferentes líneas de trabajo. Eh, no sé si Torsten tiene una palabra final para despedirnos. A ver si me entendió o si no, si le puedes traducir, Nicole. Sí. Well, I want to say thank you to Torsten and the team for allowing us to visit uh, the, the lab in Germany and show all of this and all the lines you have to offer. And actually, if you have anything that you would like to share, any final words or anything you want to share with us, feel free to do so. Yeah, of course. Uh, so thanks also uh, to you guys for hosting this event. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the tour. Um, if you have any questions or if any question uh, pops up the next days, uh, just reach out to uh, our colleagues, to Alejandro or Nicole or to Harald, and we get back to you after the event with uh, proper information. Thank you very much. Sí, por supuesto. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a ustedes por haber desarrollado este evento. Espero que a todos les haya gustado el tour. Gracias por haber estado acá. Si tienen alguna duda que surge un poquito más adelante, así sean algunos días, siéntanse libres de comunicarse ya sea con Alejandro, con Nicole o cualquier persona de nuestro equipo y con muchísimo gusto se las contestaremos. Perfecto. Eh, todos saben, al finalizar la semana de webinars, nosotros les vamos a estar enviando la presentación que compartió Torsten a lo largo de su tour y el video de esta presentación va a estar colgado en nuestro canal de YouTube también hacia final de la semana. Entonces, muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, Torsten. Muchas gracias, Harald. Muchas gracias, Nicole. Y nos vemos entonces el día de mañana. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye.